1968, a summer camp in Jeseníky, that's the high mountains in Czech Republic. I was free and feeling finally little adult, seven years, wow. And then uh, suddenly we hear microphones all over the summer camp. Get back to your cottages. And then we learned that we are occupied. And I didn't really understand what occupied is. I thought, wow, this is adventure. I was hiding behind the trees. And then they put us in the buses and the buses had a red cross sign. So they would not stop us on the road on the way home to Brno, my hometown. I was sitting by the uh, window and I saw tanks, a lot of, lot of soldiers. A kid next to me sitting, holding my hand, I remember shaking. And what did we see from uh, the windows was scary, very scary. But in the same time, also very exciting for me. I saw all the wild faces of very dark people. I never saw people like that before. They didn't look like people from Czech Republic. Mustaches, they had, you know, those, uh, how do you call that in Russian? I think it's Ruzha. And then we made it to town, to our hometown, and then I saw more and more tanks and more and more soldiers everywhere. And lots of garbage all over the streets. All the walls painted with different murals and writings. I, I did already know how to read. So it did say, Vyesh domu Ivane. That means go home, Ivan. Your Natasha is waiting for you. Girls don't love you here. Běž domů, Ivane, čeká tě Natasha. Běž domů, Ivane, tady tě holky nemilujou. <laughs> that was the song of those times. Well, then we came home. I was shaken. Then my parents explained it to me as much as they could to seven years old. And um, every morning I used to go in summer uh, to our garden, which is above our um, family house in Kohoutovice, in Brno. And uh, nobody warned me. You know, I used to go and pick some fruit, black pattern and so on in the garden. So I went maybe second day after I came from the summer camp there and I had my nightgown. And who is not on the little path going to the garden? It was a soldier. Zdravstvuj, děvočka! I got so scared. He probably wanted to be nice, but I didn't know. And more than a scared, I was ashamed because I had an item. Well, then I ran home, ran home, and told it to my parents. They said, no, no, you cannot go there anymore. That was my uh, 1968. Hard times, but we survived. We are here. In 1968, I was a first lieutenant in the United States Army, I'm stationed in Germany. The unit I was a part of, the 2nd Armored Cavalry, I had a border station in Hof near the U.S. Air Force base. We were tasked with patrolling the border between West Germany and Czechoslovakia at the time. And we did this with Jeeps with 50 caliber machine guns mounted on them and we would stop at certain locations and check out what was going on on the other side of the border in Czechoslovakia with binoculars and so on. And we were just there to ensure that the Russian occupiers of Czechoslovakia didn't utilize that border to invade Western Europe. On that day, I was in a Jeep patrolling the border and I saw Russian tanks rumbling across the border on the Czechoslovakian side. Quite a few of them and, and other Russian forces. And I was watching them and I received a radio transmission telling me and the rest of our border patrol to lock and load our weapons. And I was pretty scared because I knew that a Jeep with a 50 caliber was no match for a Russian tank. And I also knew 
that we were outnumbered 10 divisions to one uh, on NATO forces, one division, Russian forces, 10 divisions. It was on the date that the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia fully, full military force. The plans we had were serious and included a mid-range nuclear artillery, tipped artillery. And that was a scary thought. Anyway, I just revealed some <laughs> top secret information, but it's really old information and it doesn't matter at this point. I continued patrolling, continued observing the Russian forces, which were very um, prominent. And there were quite a few of them, quite a few tanks patrolling the border and making sure Czechoslovakian population didn't escape across the border or try to. And uh, later I had read a newspaper that there were demonstrations and protests going on in Prague and other locations. And I was quite scared and quite concerned and had a lot of empathy and sympathy for the Czech people. Thank you for being with Globus Books today at the anniversary of the protest of the 25th of August of 1968. Pavel, could we start with you just telling briefly about how this protest came to be, uh, what moved you to come to the Red Square that day? Well, I was uh, 28 years old. I graduated several years before from Moscow University as a physicist was planning, uh, was teaching physics in Moscow Institute of uh, Fine Chemical Technology and uh, lived no normal life of a Soviet in my physics. I read books uh, and I was very worried what happens in my country and in the world because I uh, grew up in Stalin's times when millions and millions of people were executed and sent to prison and I felt that the situation, which was improved for some time by under Khrushchev, there was so-called saw, and I thought maybe things will improve. And suddenly we see that my country suddenly become enemy of free speech. And uh, it was extremely difficult. And I felt that it's most important thing in my life to start speaking in defense of free speech. Free speech means that I can take a book you know, from my shelf and start reading it. And the one thing, uh, what that book is, who published it and who likes it and who doesn't like it, it's my book. And I can read it. I didn't steal it. Why book is so important? Because book is information. Book is something uh, to know because there are plenty of things in the world any time uh, happening which are bad. There is, life is great, but at the same time we have criminals, we have uh, threats of all types. We want to know what's going on. From childhood Russian classics, Pushkin, Lermontov, uh, Tuchev, uh, Tolstoy, Chekhov. What's so important about them? Why? These books are very important 
because in each of these books, uh, in each of these authors, there is one major theme, which is more in Russia than anywhere else. It's a theme of uh, compassion, uh, empathy to uh, small person from somebody who is very strong. And the only thing we, we have in that, we don't have weapons, but we, we want to say something. Uh, Pushkin's hero, um, man named Evgeny, whose uh, fiance was killed uh, uh, because Peter the Great didn't build the city right. Uh, I mean, it's not that simple, of course. And he feels that hatred and he wants to uh, fight. And uh, Peter the Great uh, uh, follows him. Gogol describes a poor official uh, who was had nothing except he saved money to, to buy himself overcoat. Suddenly, he, somebody takes his overcoat and basically uh, it's a tragedy of him. And everywhere there is death penalty, there is persecution, there are uh, peasants who were uh, like American blacks, were slaves. And I felt very strongly about it. And officially, uh, Russia was in, in sympathy to suffering. In fact, Russia was very often aggressive. And through that literature, through that open culture, uh, culture of, of sympathy, culture of uh, writer like Tolstoy and Chekhov who were against death penalty, all the, this type of thing against death, against persecution, and against uh, uh, forbidden of publishing, against censorship. They all have one thing in common, that uh, simple people, without weapons, without anything, have nothing uh, to protect themselves except speak up. Speak up and go on the street and, and, and speak up on the streets and demanding from government to do something. And government knew, uh, be it czars or communists or uh, or whoever are, are powers, that this is the only weapon. And they want to shoot them, they want to hide them. And if uh, Czechoslovakia was occupied by Soviet troops, they have to stop Czechs against. Oh, I felt very strongly. My friend Alexander Ginsburg was arrested uh, not for the first time because he published a uh, book uh, which basically was record of the trial of his uh, Russian writer, Sinyavsky and Daniel, and Alexander Ginsburg was arrested. He was a kind man who liked uh, literature, music. He wanted to have everybody together and enjoy the music, enjoy the art, and so on. And he went to prison for that because he, he wrote a book in defense of writers. He didn't write anything except what was told on the trial. So everybody, nobody could prove that he committed a, uh, a crime. And he was accused of being anti-Soviet agitator. And by Article 70, he was eventually sentenced to five years of labor camp. The same with my friend, his friend, uh, 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 worker Yuri Galanskov, who also did nothing. He published a magazine, Phoenix, showing how the culture can appear from nowhere as a, 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 as a phoenix what was born and reborn again. And I, I knew after all this arrest that I have to do something and I have to do the same thing. And I started at that time, didn't think about anything better, but uh, collect information about trials of these people. what conditions are in prisons, how prisoners are not f fed enough, how they are beaten uh, by uh, guards. And I decided people will know it, they know me, uh, they will start supporting me. Of course, I was not naive, I didn't know it would be easy, but I knew that we have only one weapon, our word, and we, we want to speak up. when the Soviet Union eventually invented Czechoslovakia because it, it was a phrase that Czechoslovakia speaks uh, too much. Small country, 10 million people against 200 million of, of Russia. And 
suddenly they send troops because they don't like uh, people to speak. The, uh, the Czech uh, leader, the communist, by the way, uh, who, who grew up uh, and went studying in uh, party school in Moscow, Alexander Dubček, uh, he said, we want to build uh, socialism with human faith. What a paradox, socialism with human faith. Socialism is supposed to be the best thing. Alexander Dubček was arrested, brought to, uh, to Moscow, and we learned that, uh, that he was supposed to cut their connections with uh, Russian uh, troops, with, uh, with, with uh, Warsaw Pact, and uh, make his country join, supposedly, the United States. It's almost a lie. But that lie was enough to make Soviet people who don't know better to say, yes, we are against Dubček because he wants um, to, uh, to betray our country. We saved them during the World War II. And now they want to betray us. And it was, of course, all lie. Yeah, the, uh, Dubček was arrested, Chernik, uh, Svoboda, they were brought to Moscow. They were forced, some of them, to apologize uh, for uh, for being uh, against uh, Soviet communism. Of course, it all was lies. They didn't apologize. They were not against communism. They just wanted an independent country, friend of a neighbor of everybody. And they arrested them. I already was a very uh, popular uh, person among uh, Soviet dissidents. And uh, I said to whoever I saw, we have to do something. And something was born in a small demonstration, Red Square, the main place where Soviet people protest, uh, support their government, to, to protest the government. And we were sitting in Red Square near uh, Kremlin uh, and had a slogan. I had a slogan uh, which has a great Russian uh, and Polish tradition uh, for your and our freedom. It means that at some point, Russia, uh, it was Tsarist Russia, it was uh, 19th century, occupied Poland, arrested Polish uh, leaders, uh, and uh, basically uh, wanted to, to deprive uh, Poles even smallest num uh, smallest amount of freedom. And of course, they arrested Poles, they uh, attacked Poles, and whoever survives went to immigration in uh, in uh, uh, in London. In London, some of these uh, Czech leaders uh, who were expelled from their country met Russian uh, dissidents, you could say this word, Alexander Gertsen, Russian revolutionary and socialist, and they drank together because they saw th that their enemy is Common. It's a uh, Russian authoritarianism, Russian empire, and and uh, and Gerson knew that Russia cannot be free until it will let uh, Poles free. So they had a slogan for your Poles and our freedom. And for for me, it was the same idea why I had this slogan that uh, we, uh, Russia cannot be free country if it won't let uh, Czechs. To, to be free. That's for your and our freedom. We were sitting at the Red Square on the steps outside of Kremlin uh, in so-called execution uh, place, Lobne Mesta, and had our slogan. Slogans. Uh, my friend Alexander Rimlubi had a slogan very simple. Freedom to Dubček. He didn't know where Dubček was. Actually, he already was in Kremlin, but we didn't, didn't know that. Uh, my my friend uh, Lara Bogaras had a slogan uh, in, in Czech, long live free and independent Czechoslovakia. Uh, and we were sitting there and suddenly we were surrounded. It was a red square, it was noon, it was very few people there. It was Sunday. Uh, there was not much to do, just for uh, tourists, mostly from out of the town. For, uh, came uh, just to sun themselves and look what's going on. And suddenly they see that there is a group of people, they don't know who they are, sitting on the, uh, uh, on, on the, on the step of this Lobne Miesta. They started to come up and the group of 
KGB people, we didn't know who they were, uh, started to run toward us. And in a second, I felt somebody beating me up with a, a big uh, bag, apparently full of bricks or books. Who don't, I don't know what was it, uh, Karl Marx Capital or, or, uh, or, or books, started to beat me up over, over the head. Next to me was sitting uh, my friend uh, uh, from, uh, from Leningrad who came for this demonstration to join me because he kind of expected me to organize this demonstration. We defined it. Uh, one of them is used his uh, uh, fist and inside of the fist had a, what we call in Russian kassel, uh, the steel uh, pipe uh, or something like that and started to beat him up and uh, four front teeth were broken in a moment and Vita showed me uh, th those teeth and blood in his hand. It was all happened very fast uh, and uh, some others uh, were beaten and, and does something. Then appeared some man very well dressed in what we call the Bardinovi costume uh, because everybody was very modest in, in Russia. Uh, there was no special, uh, suddenly it was very well dressed man, middle age and said, stop beating. And uh, those secret police pe uh, stopped beating. Then they brought uh, two police cars and put uh, us in, uh, in their cars. I told everybody that we are peaceful. We are not, whatever they do to us, we don't resist. So, Volodymyr uh, Lube, passionate man, he started to, I said, Volodymyr, stop. And, they, uh, and he stopped resisting and they brought him, uh, as everybody was put in the back seats of, of those police cars and brought to police station. Uh, after that, they, they came in uh, to our houses, made a search. I don't know what they uh, found, uh, what they were looking for, apparently weapons or something, but of course they didn't find anything except uh, literature, the books and flyers, but the special books. It was not books which were published in the Soviet Union because everything which is published in the Soviet Union have a permission uh, through so-called so system of love lead, which is official censorship, which uh, nothing, you can print picture of him uh, on a uh, matchbox without uh, permission. They suddenly uh, found uh, books in our things which were not published officially. It's called Samizdat. It's a kind of joking word which doesn't exist officially in dictionaries. We made it up. Myself, publishing house. I, or of course, it's a joke when all publishing houses uh, in, in Russia are official and we have myself, publishing house. It's a word which was actually invented by great uh, Russian poets. Uh, Nikolai Glaskov, uh, he uh, took a, a page, uh, uh, typewritten page with his poems, uh, folded it and uh, co connected them together and used a, a needle and thread uh, to, to make a book. And in the bottom he wrote, Sam Sibia is that, myself, self-publishing house. Then Sibia disappeared, started to call Sam is that. He was very funny, uh, great paradoxical poets. For example, one of his famous uh, poems, you know, everybody knows that he wrote it, said, Я на мир взираю из-под столика, век двадцатый, век необычайный. Чем он интереснее для историка, тем для современника печальный. So the, the poem basically means I look, I, apparently drunk, uh, uh, from under the table. Uh, think about 20th century, uh, said century, uh, and uh, and think about that century and the worst century, the better century for historians, the worse it's for people. So Russia had the tradition to have bad centuries and, uh, and we created special publishing house. That's called some is that. Somebody would bring me uh, poetry of uh, of uh, poet who died in labor camp, Osip Mandelstam. Nobody knew his poetry, nobody knew his name, except his wife, 
who survived after Andrei Sam was arrested. And later we knew, uh, we learned that he died from, uh, from hunger in Far East uh, uh, labor camp. She remembered by, uh, by heart most of his poetry. She was afraid to write it down, but she repeated it and so on. And when uh, Stalin eventually died and uh, life in Russia improved, under Khrushchev, things became milder. She dictated her friends uh, and remembers herself and wrote his great poems, uh, and a Stalin poem uh, and many other great uh, poems. Today we know that it's one of the top Russian poets uh, of 20th century. And that was some of that. There was a novel written by a uh, great Russian other poets, uh, Boris Pusterna, called Dr. Jivaga, about the, uh, the face of very nice, very mild Russian person, a doctor. Zhivaga, his life, his survival, how he was with Russians, uh, uh, white Russians and red uh, Russians, how he, uh, his uh, uh, romances, his uh, loves, uh, his faith, nothing. It was not even political roman uh, romance. It's a just book of great Russian literature. It also became some as that. But it was circulated much in Russia. It was smuggled out of, side of Russia and brought to Italy, published in Italy, and eventually got Nobel Prize. He had to refuse uh, poor thing, uh, accepting uh, Nobel Prize, said that he's a Russian patriot, he won't go anywhere, and he died in Russia. At first, he was happy that he uh, received Nobel Prize, but he never saw it. Uh, so that's the face of Russian culture, Russian literature, uh, uh, Russian poetry, um, uh, art, uh, because uh, in some other countries, if you're persecuted by government, usually you did something. You decided that you don't like government. You started a uh, revolution. Uh, you, you started throwing uh, rocks into soldiers, something, nothing was there. Like, like that in, in Russia, just peacefully people try to read books and give it to read each other. I have a copy of the book of Pasternak or uh, another uh, writer and I had a, a typewriter or maybe I can type very fast like me, uh, but uh, my wife can type or we can find um, a typist and she would uh, type the book and put, you know, that if you type, you can put carbon paper and carbon paper uh, makes several copies. And then I, I would leave one copy for me and would give several people. And these several people will give other people. And this started to spread. Like in mathematics, we call it ge geometric progression. Uh, one book becomes two books, two books become four books, and so on, and suddenly we have a publishing house. Nobody paid money for that. Just people wanted to read and wanted to give people uh, to read because they felt that they are hungry. Hungry not for uh, food, hungry for free war. That became some as that. The poetry of Mandelstam was smuggled out of the country, brought to America and in America it was printed in Russian and then translated into English uh, and his poetry started to circulate then somebody would bring it back into Russia illegally put it in a pocket or will transmit it by Voice of America or BBC or Radio Liberty and uh, suddenly it exists in the second life it came back people heard it on radio people read a new copy uh, uh, Tape, re tape recorder, what we call magnetophone at the time, suddenly it circulates again. It became known as Tam is that. If you are in Russia, uh, it's uh, here and Tam is there. So it's there is that. For them it's here, but for us it's there. So this Tam is that and Tam is that became in 1960s kind of the words meaning freedom. The government started to arrest writers who uh, who wrote and their books circulated. 
two writers, Sinyavsky and Daniel, whom I knew very well, uh, wrote novels and short stories. They were arrested and given seven and five years uh, of labor camp. Alexander Ginsburg uh, wrote a book about them uh, called White Book. He got five years of labor camp. And uh, yours truly, Pavel Litvinov, did a book about Ginsburg and some other uh, uh, Vladimir Bukovsky, who became f famous later on, I wrote two books about them. Then things started to circulate uh, wider. We decided to find out about everybody uh, who is in labor camps and mental hospitals. How did we know? Very simple. Uh, so wife of Julie Daniel, uh, future uh, friend of mine, by, and wife of Anatoly Marcin, but at that time she was married to Yuli Daniel. Uh, she uh, took a train, uh, went to see her husband, Yuli Daniel, in labor camp. And I uh, went to accompany her uh, because I had to heavy, uh, bring heavy stuff and so on. And in the camp, we meet a woman who came from, uh, from Leningrad. Irironkina. Her husband was a Leningrad chemical engineer who organized a group which tried to analyze political future of Russia. They were interested in communism and anarchism and all, all those ideas. They tried to find out. They were analytically minded and they were uh, wanted. So we met her and she told us about the case for which nine of her husband's friends were arrested. And we learn about them. And so in other places, we learn about people who, uh, who were healthy but were, uh, mentally, but who were put in, in, uh, in mental hospital. And suddenly we had so much information that you cannot write a book about anything. Then it occurred to me uh, and my friend Natasha Gerbanevsky that we have to spread it uh, with short articles which will give information about every political prisoners about whom we know. And it appeared to be very well-known publications, uh, was published throughout the world, of course, not in Russia at the time, called Chronicle of Chronicle of Current Events of Human Rights in the USSR. And that became known as Dissident Movement or Human Rights Movement. And we hoped that uh, in some other places, even under socialism, there could be more free life, like in Poland, uh, in, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia. And of course, we uh, hope that it will be even freer, like it is in the United States or in England. But at least some hope uh, that live under human face. And of course, our movement was very uh, strongly uh, suppressed, but new people appeared. People went to labor camp people lose their jobs. Uh, eventually there appeared movement for uh, people who wanted to leave their country. The most prominent part of that movement was uh, Russian Jews who wanted to live in their historical homeland. How they saw it? Israel. Suddenly it appeared the movement of millions of Jews and American Jews and German Jews, people who already knew how terrible is anti-Semitism uh, and Holocaust, all these things. So the connection between persecution of Jews and not permission uh, of people to leave their own country became obvious. So, and we learned uh, Soviet law, criminal code, criminal procedure. Uh, Soviet Union supported uh, Declaration for Human Rights of United Nations. So we learned that thing, the principles of that you can uh, speak up, whatever, you want if you don't use violence, you can leave your country and return to, uh, to that. All the principles which are natural for, for most people uh, to, to think about, about them became our weapons. Speak up in support of Soviet law. And the Soviet Union never uh, said that we are uh, against human rights. No, we are for human rights. If it's in South Africa uh, with apartheid, we are against uh, we are for human rights if it's in Pinochet who persecuted uh, Chileans, uh, so-called black uh, colonies in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. Uh, 
uh, apart even South Africa. That's Soviet Union liked because for their ideology, that's how bad it is. But they didn't want to recognize that it happens the same way in Russia. And we decided to remind them about it, remind the world. We connected to uh, Amnesty International Human Rights Organization. We, uh, I helped to, uh, to create a magazine in London called Index on Censorship. All of that became, in spite of very small amount, uh, became uh, very important united. We all, in any country where violation of, violation of human rights happens, it's the same thing. The Ch Greek are not different uh, from South Africans. Uh, Russians who oppress Poland, uh, make Poland the same way oppress other Poles, and so on. And uh, I organized demonstration, as you already said, against Soviet American Czechoslovakia, went to five years uh, of exile. Some other people went to labor camp and mental hospitals. And, and that was my life, and I'm very happy that I had this life. <laughs> These are the participants, most of them, in fact, all of them, except for Pavel, who is a mathematician and physicist by education, were uh, humanitarians. And I want to mention who they were, so we uh, give credit to their names and remember their work. Konstantin Babitsky was a linguist and a bard. Larisa Bogoraz was a linguist and a writer. Natalia Grubanevska was a philologist and a poet. And Vadim Delaunay was a philologist and a poet as well. Vladimir Dremluga studied history before he was expelled from the university. Uh, Victor Feinberg was a philologist. In fact, he wrote a work dedicated to Salinger's work. And then uh, Tatiana Baeva was also a philologist and studied history. Literature apparently, as Pavel said, had a huge influence on formation of these young people's minds. And in one of the interviews, Pavel, you quoted two chiefs. I'll read it in Russian first and then in English. Нам не дано предугадать, как наше слово отзовется, и нам сочувствие дается, как нам дается благодать, which is loosely translated as we cannot foresee how our word will resonate, uh, but we are given empathy or compassion just the way we are given grace and you have mentioned that it is one of your guiding principles so do you think that it was empathy or compassion that uh Sachustvia, that moved you and others to protest that day or is it more of a clear conscious in a sense of a more selfish motivation so I, I feel so bad that i i need to be there for my own sake so i don't feel as bad so i protest and do you think in general people are motivated by empathy and sense of justice or by self-interest and uh survival instinct it definitely uh, both but it's, it's important to understand that for us for me personally survival meant empathy, that I cannot live uh, uh, when I feel that somebody is uh, is oppressed, uh, arrested, uh, uh, I have to sympathize and I have to say that I am for you, you cannot suffer uh, on my dime. It's interesting that uh, uh, Russian 18th century writer uh, Radishev uh, wrote famous book, uh, my trip to, from Moscow uh, to, to Petersburg, uh, and it started with a phrase, "Я взглянул вокруг себя и и душа моя стала уязвлена страданиями человечества." I looked around me and saw the suffering of all humanity around me. So for him, it didn't matter. Uh, is it his suffering or somebody else? He just couldn't do it. He had to write a book showing how people live under um, slavery, uh, Russian uh, serfdom, and so on. And he had to speak up. Uh, and it's not important who we are by profession. Russian literature helped us to express things because Russia was famous for those great books of Dostoevsky and, and Tolstoy. The whole world knew it, but in all other ways, 
Russia was pretty much despised uh, for its backwardness. Uh, it's important that you mention our professions. First of all, unfortunately, I don't want to, uh, to say it, but I have to say yeah, it's a little bit different in our professions. First of all, uh, our eight people were part of the bigger movement for human rights. And the selection which we got there was more or less accidental. Uh, so uh, my other friend, Andrea Malrik, wrote uh, statistics who was what profession. And we found out that half of human rights activists, and we had names about 1,000 people who we knew, many people were uh, human rights activists, but they didn't use their names. But about 1,000 people who signed le letters of, of protest, about half of them were uh, scientists, physicists, or biologists. If you look at the committee, uh, the first committee for human rights, there were three founders, Andrei Sakharov, uh, Valeria Chilidze and uh, Andrei Tverdakhlebov, all of them were physicists. So uh, there were many writers, one of the first participants among writers, of course, was the most famous Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but there was Vladimir Vainovich. Uh, the human rights are human rights, and the only reason you stand for it, because you feel that you cannot live with the, without freedom of speech, uh, Freedom of protest. Probably my favorite uh, work of Russian literature is the epilogue of the War and Peace. And in it, Tolstoy thinks about the nature of history and uh, asks the question, what moves people? And also is trying to solve uh, the question whether uh, one person can make a um, difference in history. And uh, based on the history of protest in Russia, with um, many people coming to the central squares in St. Petersburg and Moscow, starting with the Decembrists and ending up with the Pussy Riot and some other activists, and of course, with your protest being a big part of it, uh, do you think that such protests can actually change the course of history? I believe that whatever we, we did gradually brought the difference. The Soviet Union fell partly because of the ideas we had to distribute. The person like Gorbachev, absolutely miraculous uh, figure, which appeared uh, unexpectedly uh, in Central Committee of Communist Party, uh, of course, he, he read Russian books and he understood the connection uh, between literature and freedom. He actually was in the uh, Institute of uh, Communist Party, uh, lived in the, in the same room with a, with, with a Czech communist of his age, uh, Mlynerz, who was participant later in Prague Spring. Hi, Pavel. Um, Hi, Ben. I was uh, on the other side of the border patrolling it when that all happened. Uh, I would ask you if you can relate what happened then um, with the invasion of the full invasion of the USSR, or at least a lot of its military might, um, to Russia as it is now under Putin, and what is happening in the United States with Trump, the direction it's going in? Uh, it's a very good question. I'm worried very much, and I will start from the very beginning that I um, hate uh, Trump and hate what he does to the United States. I, I think uh, by his character and his uh, behavior and, uh, and lawmaking, he uh, really uh, wants to turn the United States in, in some kind of uh, semi-authoritarian, it's very far from that, but uh, something about the authoritarian state, because he, he, he doesn't believe in human rights, he doesn't believe in first amendment or uh, constitution, and he wants uh, to have control, and he thinks that he knows what, what, what to do. Uh, and in the United States, the first point, first, number one amendment uh, of constitution is freedom of, of speech. He doesn't care about that. Uh, and freedom of complaint. Uh, uh, go to the street and, and speak up. He, he hates it. 
he of course demonstrated many times by his own words hatred to people of color he hates blacks and he, hispanics uh, arabs uh, muslims you name it and basically whom he feels best with uh, uh, putin why because uh, there is mutual understanding of him they are cynical they love money and that's most important thing and everybody else uh, they, they despise so uh, before i came to the united states i believed that the united states is such a great country that nothing uh, like, like i live through in eastern europe in, 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 in russia it can happen to the united states uh, unfortunately i was wrong and i uh, i believe that we have to to watch because people in the united states are the same people like people in russia they're made of the same uh, type of dna just we develop culturally our institutions uh, our, our government uh, our system of uh, of balances and, and, and support All, only that way we, we, we can survive if we uh, think that if i have more money more power uh, i can kick your ass uh, uh, and they have a right to do it. It's not what uh, George Washington came to uh, to install. It's not what we had in Constitution. It's not what we we had in uh, fighting in civil in civil war. So we are free as much as we believe that our freedom is important. If we don't believe in freedom, we, we will lose it. It seems to me that that is being moved in the direction that Trump wants it to be moved in through lack of real justice right now, through criminality um, and corruption, and similar to, and, and authoritarianism, similar to what Putin does. I mean, he yeah. is obscured with trillions of dollars from the Russian people. Uh, he's uh, run all the big companies and corporations in Russia through his oligarchs, who he controls. and. It's a criminal er enterprise, and so was Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany was a criminal enterprise. So it, it seems to me that that's the direction, unfortunately, that the U.S. will move in if Trump stays in office. Yeah, I, I, I hope he, he won't, and I call anybody in this audience that don't forget to vote. We have to vote. Trump tries to steal our election by creating some funny problem uh, this post office put his own body um, uh, to, to create atmosphere in, in which uh, several votes can come in the wrong way, uh, can make uh, fate of our country change. So we have to watch, we have to protest. Uh, I, I hope we, we win, but we just have to re realize we are not saints. We are not better. In any country in the world, there might appear a bad much of history which makes this country going going uh, wrong way we, we have to uh, we, our country is great it's a special country it can build the best uh, airplanes it uh, created cosmic programs it uh, we have uh, all uh, computers and computer related were invented in the United States we have absolutely fantastic uh, guys who uh, can invent uh, new software and things like that, but all of that works because people are free. Because to do great science, you have to have a uh, free country. Russia, under under the USSR, as as the USSR was supposed to be a communist country, but really it was an authoritarian com country like any any authoritarian uh, rule and um, it, Russia as it is now is still an authoritarian country although it seems to be ruled by one former KGB man named right. Putin. Socialism has other directions that it can move in. Socialism isn't necessarily an authoritarian form of government and Bernie Sanders it seems to me was pointing towards a direction that would equalize the economic inequity in this country and the direction that's pointing to a lot of 
American oligarchs and American authoritarianism that that is seems to be headed by Trump in his direction. What what is your view on on a real social democracy, kind of like the Scandinavian models? Oh, I like Scandinavian models. Uh, but, but I am very suspicious with the word socialism because it's so much distorted uh, view of the world. But uh, the government is has to be responsible for people getting uh, medical care. Uh, people, uh, if, if they have an earthquake, we have to help people uh, what happened. In other words, mutual help is a, is a part of uh, uh, of human uh, society. Should it be called socialism? How to work, how to organ organize medical care? People have to talk, people have to discuss and find find the solution. So I, I, I'm personally not uh, socialist in any way, but I understand, uh, for example, through my own experience that we have to uh, have uh, some kind of reasonable and not prohibitively expensive law of, of medical care. It has to be there. You cannot rely completely on capitalism and on market economy to, to treat people because nobody, if, if you got really sick, nobody makes enough money to pay for it. So we have to give insurance. But what kind of insurance? We have actually, we have to have guarantee people minimal insurance for survival and all, all types of things uh, we, we, we know there could be fire we, we, we pay for fire um, team for fire uh, brigade for the whole village and that's how we live we have to have schools we cannot just say that people pay for the own, own education some people are lucky uh, and they could send uh, kids to private schools, but most people have to have a reasonably good school. And, uh, and it's not only uh, moral judgment, it's also practical judgment, because people without, without good education, uh, if you compare life in, let's say, uh, in Louisiana and Connecticut, you, you could see the difference. And part of the difference is that, uh, that uh, Connecticut take care about their uh, schools and uh, and, and poor uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, take care much less. They don't have money. Uh, the federal government is not supposed to help or help not, uh, not enough. And we have continuous tradition that in, in, uh, we have great industry, great culture in New Haven and in Hartford. I, I believe that, that we have to help uh, those uh, who uh, who suffer, who are under, people are born different, people can be born with this uh, inborn disease, we have to help each other. And that's, that's part of, so the, the point is not capitalism, the point is uh, ability of mutual help and our life and constitution implies it. I agree, I agree, my son and his children live in Sweden I mean, they have other problems uh, as well, but at least uh, nobody is uh, is deprived of, of medical help. No, nobody is hungry and they uh, reasonably respect each other. They have problems, but at least that thing we have to uh, agree. We call, call it social democracy, fine. Uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> we have to invent words, but the, the word for me is freedom and, and democracy. It's great to see you. We, we never we never met. I, I, I know, but I know I, who you are. We have yeah, I, I actually I, I remember I, I met Alexander Ginsburg many times. Could uh, could we go back to, to sixty eight? I I actually have a very personal question. So you are twenty eight. Uh, of course, you're a dissident. Uh, you hate the Soviet regime. All of us uh, did. I, I left Soviet Union in 78. I was 21 years old for the same reason. I just could not exist within the Soviet Union. But the reason I left was because I knew that otherwise 
I will do something and they will put me in prison. And so this was a very practical choice. Uh, it was not a very easy choice because this actually was a very risky and complicated process to try to emigrate uh, and not everybody succeeded. But I took my chance and I would guess I was lucky. But my question is this, it's 68, you are 28 years old. Uh, you go for demonstration and it's basically clear that you are going to be arrested. I mean, yes. it's, it's not that it's not clear because when you just, you know, hate the Soviet Union or read some of that or type some of that, or even when you print an underground newspaper, well, there is a chance they will not notice it, they will not see it, they will not arrest you. When you go to, to Red Square to demonstrate, there is no chance. I mean, you know that you are going At to be arrested. Time, yeah. You probably know that you are going to get like five to seven years. This is a very difficult decision at the end, in the last moment, to make this decision to go. It's, it's a very difficult one because you know that from that particular day, next time you will be free and not necessarily, right? Because number yeah, one, yeah. you would have to survive concentration camp, which is not easy. And actually, Yuri Galansky, Galanskov, Galanskov. Uh, Galanskov sorry, uh, did not. Uh, and then I, I guess there were many cases, I do not really remember what happened to, to, to your group, oh, yeah, people yeah. are exiled after the, 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 they're, you know, free from the camp. Uh, so it's kind of, it might be forever. So my first question is how, I mean, how this decision is made. I, I, I find it extremely, I mean, Say that you, oh, you guys, you're so brave. I mean, okay, it's good. My second question is, why uh, the fact that you were exiled, not sentenced to, to, to labor camp, camp, does it have, I, I don't know, does it have anything to do with the fact that you are Litvinov? Uh, uh, both questions uh, together. So for, I definitely knew that if I went to Red Square, I, I will be in, in prison for many years. And actually, as you noticed, uh, my term in exile, although working as a minor, it was tough, but, uh, but definitely it, it was better than live behind uh, barbed wire in the camp. The Soviet Union, uh, uh, try to be in, uh, unpredictable. They did it uh, way, uh, one way, one times, and the next day, day they do other times. For example, uh, later than my arrest, there was a movement uh, for uh, Russian Jews uh, to uh, to go to Israel to leave the Soviet Union, and some of these Jews just got permission and left, and some of them went. Uh, uh, for 15 years uh, of labor camp, uh, like Sharansky. Uh, so uh, it, it's unpredictable. In my particular case, uh, there were a combination of things which could work both ways. I was uh, the best known dissident at that time. So uh, they uh, will have to make me uh, the, the main kind of martyr. And uh, I, I'm not sure they wanted uh, to do that focus. And definitely my uh, the, the fact that, uh, that uh, it, it, it was my case uh, because of my grandfather, obviously they uh, consider that. Interestingly enough that my grandfather's name will completely disappear from the books in, in, in 1960s. It started to uh, appear because of the long history between Stalin and Hitler and, uh, and the fact that my grandfather was Jewish. So it was a complicated thing, but the Soviets respected him, uh, they hated him, but at the same time, uh, they had to be more careful with me. Uh, so uh, I think combination of the fact is that I was well known and uh, partly well known because of my grandfather uh, made unexpected solutions that I went to, not prison camp, but 
exile. But at the same time, uh, when I uh, returned from exile uh, and started to return to my, uh, in a modest way at the time, to my activity, I was arrested again, uh, threatened this beating and, and said, next time you won't go like uh, Dom Odbik, the uh, recreation place like you were the last time, in uh, that mines where, where I was. So next time I would have gone to labor camp. So it's, it's really difficult to say, but they definitely, uh, the truth is uh, that they definitely paid attention to public relations side of their, uh, of their harassment of these events. Did they ever mention to you that while we, we sent you in exile, into exile because of your grandfather, if it's not ne never. Never. If it's not for him, we will put you in prison for like everybody else. No, it, it implied, uh, but never did. There was a funny uh, thing, of course they knew, uh, that uh, when I started my activity, Larissa Bogaraz and I, uh, first uh, I myself, then we wrote together several letters which were uh, in defense of human rights, uh, these protests, uh, they were published uh, uh, in, in the West, they were transmitted by Voice of America, BBC, Radio Liberty. And uh, because of this radio, we became very famous. And in several days, Larissa and I received almost identical letters um, written on a beautiful paper with perfect uh, calligraphic handwriting. And basically, the first line of letter to Nibel, uh, why do you son or Kike's uh, descendant shame uh, your great grandfather. It's very funny that uh, calling me uh, in Jewish insult, uh, of course, was because they could call me, uh, being Jewish, call me, call me Jew, but at the same time I'm a Jew because my grandfather was a Jew. So they didn't see that contradiction, they wanted to insult me. Uh, so, but uh, officially never even a hint. But at some point they decided to kick me out of the country. In the end of, uh, they started to hint me uh, that if I want to go, I should go, or otherwise I, I will get into trouble much worse than this. So at that time they, they reminded uh, me that I'm Jewish, but specifically about my grandfather they never mentioned, except uh, the, the, this letter. Did you ever have an experience of whatever cases when a government official, party official, I should say, would talk to you privately, sincerely, would ask your opinion about the Soviet Union, what should be changed, how they should reform the system, how you Maybe could help not. them, how they are unlucky with what's going on with the Soviet Union. And I'm talking about later, yes, probably prior to to perestroika, before it became obvious that perestroika is happening. I'm trying to understand if there were attempts of the you know Soviet official or party officials to approach the dissidents and kind of discuss with them what's what's wrong with the system or how the system might be reformed in their opinion. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to say because for every uh, opinion in one way, you can say opinion in another way. I remember I spoke with, uh, I never was a member of Communist Party, but I, I was kind of friendly when I was in university with a, a Communist uh, Party leader in the chair uh, of acoustics where I was at the time working on my dissertation. And he knew that I was active he knew that he warned me that I will be arrested soon. I, I knew it <laughs> even without him saying, but he, he, he was a decent guy, very careful. And uh, he said to me, uh, you know, uh, that Russia is such a country, people are so passive, they don't want to uh, change. Uh, there is 300 years uh, in Russia and nothing will change. Uh, what do you think about that? I said, well, 300 years is okay with me. <laughs> so that's uh, my attitude. Uh, nobody knows the future, but if you feel you have to do it, a lot of things can be done. Who expects that we'll have such a uh, champion of human rights like Andrei Sakharov, whom I was 
платя до нова. Апият мен говори на small town and the military installation, building weapons, but at the same time, his brain continues to work and think about that thing. And at some moment, he also, he started to talk to Soviet officials and to members of Academy of Science, and they uh, had to answer him something. But at some point, he realized that, uh, that not enough to talk to them, and he started to speak uh, in the Academy of Science against the uh, influence of Soviet biologist Lysenko. Uh, and immediately they noticed, who is that? And somebody said, well, it's the guy who invented uh, nuclear bomb. Uh, we have to get rid of him. We cannot get rid of him. So, but eventually they got rid of him. First, they, uh, they kicked him out from uh, membership of this military industrial complex that he couldn't work. He lost uh, Dobus uh, permission uh, to work. And, and eventually they put him in exile. You know the story. But nobody expected to have such a man suddenly appear. His name was Secret. I, when I was in the university, there, he was mentioned in the textbook and physics once without explaining who, who he was. Uh, and here, here he was. And uh, so things are going complicated and predictable way. We have to. Who would expect that quiet uh, uh, Belarusia uh, suddenly have quiet uh, demonstrations? Who knows where it will go? We, we can predict this and that, but suddenly it happens. Uh, so I, I'm optimist basically in my attitude toward life, but I don't know when and I can, don't have a proof that I'm right. It's, that's a great message and attitude, though, especially now. I mean, I like hearing that. I will thank you very much. It was. Okay. Uh, we'll have some. Darina, thanks a lot. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you for your okay. input. Thank you, Yuri. 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 Thank Thank you, Yuri. 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 Thank you, Yuri knowing that you probably will be arrested and facing the prison sentence because we actually uh, again lucky to have in our audience another activist uh, who did such a thing it was quite recent in 2015 uh, the group uh, called uh, art collective called blue rider with Evgeny avilov that you see right here i heard the name yes they protested by throwing holy water at the Lenin's Muslim. And uh, Evgeny is right here in the audience as well. Hello. Uh, so I have a question about uh, punitive psychiatry. So how people, how did they come back after it? And another one question, how this uh, diagnosis got justified by the court? What do they say? Excellent question. I, uh, in our time, in the beginning of our, uh, uh, of our movement in the mid 60s, uh, the, the Soviet authorities decided to use uh, uh, psychiatry as a way of controlling dissent. Uh, and uh, they used it before. I had a friend who in Stalin, uh, Yuri uh, Azarkan, who in Stalin's time was in Leningrad, spent nine years uh, in uh, in mental hospital, uh, prison mental hospital, and it was quiet. Uh, there were some intelligent people. He actually said that it's the best thing which could happen to them. Uh, and at some moment in 1960s, there was a movement uh, so-called smog movement, the young poets who read poetry in uh, Mayakovsky Square and, uh, and circulated poetry, and some of them were arrested and put in the mental hospital for months or two. But it, it all uh, didn't make enough effect. And at some point they decided some uh, uh, so-called doctors like Snezhnevsky, uh, for example, who invented the, uh, the concept of so-called slow developing uh, schizophrenia uh, and started to put, uh, they put Natasha Verbanevska, General Dolgarenko, Viktor Feinberg, 
you know, Vladimir Bukovsky at different periods, they put them, and they thought uh, that this method will, uh, will work and they stop descent because they say, okay, all these descents are crazy. This distance, uh, so we, we don't want to de deal with crazies. We, uh, we will treat them and so on. And it didn't work. Uh, suddenly, uh, Vladimir Bukovsky, together with psychiatrist Glusman uh, from Leningrad, wrote a book showing uh, how they treat them. Uh, so there were plenty of things. My other friend, Yuri Galanskov, was tortured by so called pills of stelazin. Uh, which almost drove him crazy. Grigorenko uh, at some point was, was tortured by, by some drugs. Uh, so, but there was big world scandal and eventually they started to use less and less of that. And the Soviet Union was uh, expelled from World Psychiatric Association, which was very useful to them. So it's a terrible uh, torture. Uh, and uh, today, it does look like they use it much, but they could, could use it uh, any time. There were two, three cases I heard about that, but at some point in, the, in our time, they really tried to use it against the sins. Thank you. Hi, I, I was five years old in 1968, so for, for me and maybe I can speak for my generation, you're living it legend so it's just it's extreme pleasure for me to to have an opportunity to see you on zoom uh, my question is did your parents know about your intentions and how they react to what happened were they surprised did they know did you share your plans with them yeah it's a good question i actually uh, share every, almost everything with my parents and they sympathize. They were worried about me, uh, yeah. what happens, but they sympathize. But I didn't share with them specifically uh, uh, about demonstration going uh, there. I, I learned that they, they would know, but I didn't want them to start worrying immediately. Uh, and they learned uh, the same evening after we were searched and brought uh, to, to, uh, to prison. But uh, so we had great mutual understanding, but I didn't want to add their, uh, their word and I didn't say it to them immediately. Yeah, advance. so so you felt even in that time you did have their their support, and oh, yeah. you felt that they, yeah, that's yeah, yes, yeah, it yeah. would be very difficult if I didn't. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, thank God. I, in our family, basically, we were all united my, and my sister who is still in moscow yeah. she is five years younger than me yeah. she uh, probably one of the oldest distant she continued to help families of political prisoners she mm -hmm. goes to trials of uh, you can look at the uh, facebook and see nina yeah. Litvinova almost mm -hmm. every day uh, she, in spite of not being young and yeah. healthy she continues to do it so thank god we yeah. had mutual I it, again, thank you, and I'm wishing you health and, you know, you, you just inspire me. So one last question from the audience here in Zoom is, what is your advice to people in um, the United States right now? Um, I know you said vote, which is pretty old. Vote, vote and vote. In addition to voting, is there any other word of wisdom? Uh, I will tell you that in 2008, my wife and, uh, and I uh, went to Pennsylvania and knocked at the door and talked uh, uh, people to vote for Obama. Uh, so uh, if there is not far from you, there is a state in which uh, there is probability that it can click, that, that's one of the advices. But basically, no matter who wins, uh, America is such a treasure we have to support the American Constitution uh, and, and fight for it. It's, well, it's the greatest country. I, I love Russia. It's my country from which I came, but uh, my attachment to, uh, to freedom in America is, is even bigger. And we have to understand that, that it's a special country, exceptional country, and we have to fight for it. I was very glad that we had a, such that, that Colonel Windemann, uh, who uh, worked in the White House, and he 
showed his uh, I, uh, I, uh, Russian Jewish ideals, spoke up, lost his job, and I admire him. He is the spirit of Russian descent. There was a photographer in the audience who had to leave, um, Avi, and he passed the message that um, it's hard to imagine that he actually heard from the man whose name he heard for so long. Uh, and I know he's into uh, Kudelka's photography and wanted to go to Prague. So that. Oh, I, I met Kudelka. I was. Uh, and he, oh, he is absolutely great. Yeah. 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 I. I, I, I I, I talked with my friend today about him because I have a friend who is from uh, Uzhgorod and he, uh, it was very close to, uh, to Czech, Czech uh, border and he uh, every day, uh, every time when there is 25th of August, he, he calls me and we talked about that and we remembered Kudelka and his museum. Mm -hmm. And one of the question is, Pavel, uh, what is your opinion as to uh, why the majority of Soviet emigres in the United States hold right-wing views? It's very really sad, but it's true. I don't know the majority, but a lot of them are. Uh, I would say uh, I think about that for many years and get upset, sometimes get into fights, uh, not physical fights, but w word fights uh, with these people. Uh, I, I think one of the story, uh, very simple part, is that they got used to life in Russia and maybe some of them are even in Soviet Union. And they kind of have a habit that if so something is bad, it has to be uh, answered by force. And uh, the idea of answering by force about hatred uh, that if, if you, uh, somebody votes for Trump, uh, you can say, I have to hate him. I don't hate him. I'm upset with him. I can tell him that he's a fool, maybe, but uh, I, I don't have, a, he grew up that way. He heard it from his parents, from his school. He comes to the United States and he immediately says, oh, so some people have to be in prison and they're not in prison. Or, uh, uh, they would make up things which they repeat to each other. I remember when I came to the United States, everybody said in, in, I was in New York, or oh, those uh, blacks, they all cannot behave, they uh, rob people, attack, and they don't want to work. All types of nonsense they repeated uh, today. Uh, and it creates uh, some kind of attitude and habit, and they uh, support each other and, and very difficult. I, the only thing I notice is that their children are much better <laughs> most of the time. So let's hope that their, their children, they sometimes complain about their children, said, oh, they didn't see communism. Yeah, but they know better. Uh, I, I love it how you always find the way to turn it in an optimistic, positive way. That This is terrific. I was just curious, uh, because when you came to the United States, Ayn Rand, who was originally from St. Petersburg, yes. and had such a great influence on the situation that we're having now. Um, Unfortunately, yes. Have you met her? No. No, I, I didn't meet her. Uh, I, I never heard about her when I came to the United States. I, I uh, read several years later, uh, a friend of mine, uh, she's a well-known blogger, uh, uh, Katie Young, she wrote a big, uh, big article about her and I heard about her and uh, Katie Young read everything about her. Uh, and I understood uh, that it's basically a very interesting and talented writer, uh, but she is nuts in my opinion, all, all her ideas that if I build a, uh, some big house, beautiful, and they didn't build it right, I have a right to explode that house. Uh, all, all this type of freedom brought to, uh, to absolute. Uh, this objectivism, it's very, for me, it's a communism of different type. Uh, that's super capitalism and pride that I can, Whatever I can do, I, I can do is, uh, is freedom. I, I love freedom, but uh, I, I believe that we live in, in society and we have to respect each other and 
and respect uh, uh, other people. And if we decide that there is a law which helps everybody, you have to follow that law. You cannot uh, uh, blow up a house because you don't like the way they built it. That's my attitude toward uh, Ayn Rand. And what you just said about living in society and having freedom uh, reminded me of something that I heard or read by uh, Natalia Garbanevska, who said that yes. uh, you guys lived with a sense of responsibility and that what is freedom without the sense of responsibility. And with that, I would like to pass the final word to you. Uh, and uh, I, I think what we've learned today is that one can have freedom no matter what and what restricted circumstances we exist or what hardship we are facing. It's still our choice uh, to, to take the right decision and exercise our freedom, but not without the sense of responsibility. So, yeah. Pavel, and what would be the last words, last wisdom that you would like all of us, uh, your audience, to depart with today on the anniversary of the protest? Well, the life is beautiful. I visited uh, Ch Czech Republic several times, and last year I was in uh, Slovakia, and I'm happy that these countries are f free. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily happy, they complain all the time, but that's what freedom is, you, you complain. <laughs> the, 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 in New York, you live with all, all the time, all New Yorkers complain, but uh, it's part of freedom. So complain and understand that, that there is no paradise here, but there is normal life and uh, and live and enjoy their life and use it wi wisely. I'm an old teacher and I uh, tell you what I tell to my former students. <laughs> well, you're a wonderful teacher and we all are very lucky if we learn uh, from you at least some so thank you so much for your time for your brilliance i'm blown away okay thank you Zerina, for organizing that and uh, you learn all the stuff you were very thorough usually uh, journalists don't pay attention to details you did everything correct and i appreciate your work I appreciate the chance and i appreciate the kind words and the time thank you so much Pavel. it okay. was a bye bye Bye, everyone. Thank you for being with us today.